remember the story of Autumn Bench. Uh, this was last year. She was a 16-year-old girl a year ago, July, and she was in a plane, small plane crash with her grandparents. They were both killed, and she walked away from it. And she, you know, made her way through the woods. She was hungry and wet and cold and scared and alone. And uh, when she was finally found, they asked her what kept her going. And she said, uh, I didn't want to die before I was hugged again. I wanted another hug. Um, she was longing for connection. And I thought that was such a beautiful, a beautiful story. You know, we're human beings and we, we do long for connection. We're social creatures. We thrive on uh, connecting with families and friends and church families and uh, even just people on the street. You know, sometimes we just need to be around other people. It's the air that we breathe. Well, last week we began a worship series based on a book called um, Leading Causes of Life. And we talked about choosing life last week. And today we're talking about connections. <clears throat> Gary Gunderson and Larry Prey wrote this book, and um, they have a lot to say about, about connection. We'll be talking a little bit about some of the things that they talk about. But one of the things they started in this chapter was just kind of going through different ways that we connect. And uh, one of the things they talked about was, you know, in our bodies, all the processes that have to work together to make us uh, who we are. And um, one, time, one scientist said, you know, we think we are individuals, but actually we're whole communities of organisms and things going on in our body. And then, of course, our very survival depends on our relationship, our connection to, to nature and to the earth and how we treat this uh, beautiful creation. Eco-psychologists, which I didn't know existed, um, are realizing that immersion into nature uh, brings about life-enhancing peace and joy and zest and ability to be uh, facing things with a positive attitude, to understand the interconnectedness with all things. Uh, we know that our senses and our minds and our bodies have this kind of rhythm, right, with the natural world. And uh, a lot of studies demonstrate that obesity and depression and other problems are linked to not spending enough time outdoors. You know, that's called nature deficit disorder. You might have ADD, but now you can also have NDD. Uh, we know too how connected we can be to our animals, to our pets. You know, for some of us, they are our children. Especially once kids get out of the house, you know, we, we still long for those kind of daily connections and routines, and so we, we do that sometimes with our animals. Uh, that's become a thing right now. But way back in, I think it was 1860, Florence Nightingale said uh, that a small pet often is an excellent companion for the sick. And so now, you know, 150 years later, we're really getting that. And we're, um, we have therapy dogs and dogs that go to the hospital and, and uh, just lay down with people and kitty cats and things like that. And it, it does enhance uh, our experience of whatever is going on. Just about 30 seconds before my mom took her last breath, our dog Charlie came running from the living room, jumped up on her bed, and just cuddled into her side. She held him every day those last few years, and he knew instinctively that he, he needed to be there then, and he wanted to say his goodbyes. So he uh, was just another place where that connection was so visible. We're also connected to geographical spaces, you know, places that have been significant to us, homes we've lived in, um, places where we visited grandma or where the ancestors lived, even if we never lived there ourselves. Um, when I went back to Colorado last month and reconnected with my high school friends, I felt this connection to my roots that I hadn't felt for a very long time. And I, I loved connecting with those friendships that helped to form me. And we're here as a very expression of God's connection to us and our connection to God, this God that leads us beside the still waters, um, sits at table with us. The list could go on and on, right? Connections foster human life, many, many connections. Um, some we can see, some we can't, some we feel, some we don't. Uh, we also know that because of that, though, that we can cause a great deal of harm 
with our connectedness as well, because if we harm one, we harm a lot in our interconnectedness. So it's important to, as we were talking with the kids, you know, put on that uh, daily uh, wardrobe of love and compassion. Well, in the leading causes of life, Anderson talks about his kind in a small landlocked locked, um, southern African nation called Lesotho. And um, while I was there, he learned about this uh, this concept called Othello. I think it's Othello. It's B O P H E L O. Othello or Othello. Um, but it's a word and a concept that affirms the oneness of many connections. So they don't see human relationships or bodies or nature or air or water or uh, health or illness, life or death, as any as separate things. They're all this piece of who they are. And so it's this this ensemble that creates the music of their lives. So when the author was there seeking to learn about how faith and health work together in their community, their answer, uh, you know, as a reflection to his question, was this Othello that they talked about the mountains, how the mountains were a source of their water, a place of safety, a symbol for things that don't change, and yet the rivers and the roads, the things that bring us together, uh, allow them to visit the villages, allow people to, a family to bring things to them. And then they talk about the fields where their food grows and the doctors and the nurses that come and visit them and keep their uh, bodies and minds healthy. So all of those things, the nature, the infrastructure, the food, the friendships, the doctors and the nurses, the water, the God, the villages, everything was the answer. Um, because nothing was distinct. It was all this ensemble that made them who they were. At the heart of creation and of religion and spirituality is this deep, deep desire to connect. Religion means uh, to bind back, to, to come together. And um, Gunderson was saying that it's part of what has helped churches to continue to survive, if not thrive, is the fact that we can connect in a way, in a different way than other places, because we take this idea of family beyond blood. So we might come here with our families, and we love our families, and we have our family, but we also have this family, this body of Christ that becomes such an integral part of who we are and how we um, uh, invest our time and our money and our uh, desire to be with each other, to help each other, to grow with each other. So this reading we heard from Paul's letter uh, to the Colossians is uh, about this quality of congregational relationships. And so when he's speaking um, about clothing ourselves with compassion and kindness and humility, seeking to bear one another's burdens and learn to practice forgiveness. He's talking to churches. He's talking to people like us who come together once a week and, and try to figure out who we are and how we can be a little better throughout the week. And so he's telling us, practice those things in community so that when you leave here, you go out clothed uh, with Christ. Very special connection. Uh, I have four sons. Three of them are married and one who isn't but has a significant other. And of those uh, folks, three of them work from home. And they talk about how important uh, either going to church or getting together with friends or having Friday night dinners, whatever it is they do to create this uh, connection with people that they don't get at work anymore. So it used to be you go to work and you chat with your uh, your workmates, you know, you sit in the lounge, you eat lunch, you have the coffee together. They don't have that anymore. There are a lot of bonuses to working from home, and they like those bonuses. But in some ways, it's added to the busyness of their lives because in their free time, they have to create this connectedness to people that they long for. Uh, Yohan Hari wrote an article, uh, and it was online last week, and it was a big deal. People were passing around. It said, uh, the title of it was The Likely Cause of Addiction Has Been Discovered and It's Not What You Think. And in this article, he's talking about the fact that addiction is not necessarily about the drugs themselves, but the addict's inability to connect with other people in his environment or her environment. So he was saying that nearly everyone, for instance, who has a hip replacement, is giving, given this dimorphine which is an 
pharmaceutical heroin, and yet they don't get they don't get addicted to it. And rats, who alone in a cage would actually kill for this stuff uh, in lieu of food, won't do it at all if they're in Rat Park, which is a, uh, a rat paradise that's been, uh, I guess, elect erected for these different kinds of experiments of, of socialization and isolation with rats. So it was interesting to think that so often in uh, people do become more isolated, don't they? And uh, I know I have a couple of friends whose bottom experience was when they were drinking alone and drank too much and got very, very sick to the point of almost death. And I realized that as they got more and more into their drinking lifestyle, they isolated more and more because they didn't want people to know about it. So that's sort of what made some sense to me that, you know, we need each other and we need each other all the time in all circumstances. Um, Florence Nightingale also said, the needs of the spirit are as crucial to health as those individual organs that make up the body. Um, so there was a study of 10,000 men and they were following these men to uh, see the, uh, the, growth, uh, the outgrowth of uh, heart disease in different people's lives. And it turned out that the men who were able to say they felt loved by their wives, this is interesting, were less likely than those who didn't to develop um, angina over the next five years. And then, I, I don't know if this was the same study or, or how it worked, but they were talking about uh, patients who had received cardiac catheterization. And those who weren't married or, and didn't have any close friends were more likely to die within the next five years of heart, uh, heart problems. So it's interesting, we need these relationships, don't we? We need connection with each other, with animals, with this beautiful creation that surrounds us, with this awesome God who created it all for us. Um, we need life around us. I'm an introvert, and although I love close relationships and good conversation, I could easily never leave my house. Now I know there's more than one of me in this room, but I'm grateful when people get me out of the house, right? They invite me to a show or a movie or on a walk because on my own, I just soon stay in my little uh, fortress there. And um, when I'm with people, I feel this need to kind of figure out who I am in the midst of, you know, a loud room with multiple personalities. And I know some of you are going, huh? You know, because here you are standing in a pulpit. I've been standing in a pulpit for 16 years now, and I still can't picture myself here. This is my God connection. God put me here and I trust God to feed me my lines. My entire vocation is completely reliant on God showing up and getting me through. I love church, I love God, I, I'm a Jesus freak. I trust the spirit implicitly to be here in me and surround me when I'm doing this on Sunday mornings. I uh, do not have the personality for this and it was a big surprise to me that this is where I wind up. My Christian life could easily be spent in a room with a candle and a book. I'd be just fine. But God believes we need to be connected. And so we need each other. It's vital to the church. It's vital to the world that the body of Christ exists and works together for the common good, for God's love and compassion to be known by everyone. As Christians, you know, we believe things happen for a reason, and we believe that because in our souls, we know we're connected. So if we're connected in all things, then things happen for a reason. And we might be responsible for our own judgments, for sure. We're in possession of our own free will, we know that. But we're also part of something larger, right? Something much larger. And we gain confidence from knowing that we're not isolated from one another. A middle school teacher asked her class to write definitions of a friend. And these were some of the descriptions she received. A friend is a pair of open arms in a society of armless people. A friend is a warm bedroll on a cold and frosty night. A friend is a mug of hot coffee on a damp and cloudy day. A friend is a beautiful orchard in the middle of the desert. 
friend is a hot bath after you've walked 20 miles on a dusty road. Everything I read this week reminded me that we are much better together than alone. Life can be rough, life can be sad and lonely. We need to hold each other up, comfort each other, encourage each other, get each other out of the house, hold on to each other, love each other, bring abundant life to each other. Sometimes we just need to reach out and grab a hand. Steve Garnis Holmes wrote this. God has so ordered the symphony that all the different notes are indispensable. Your gift may be a note of the melody shouted out by the trumpet, or it may be the harmony of the third violin, subtle but changing everything, or the oboe quietly offering a counter melody, each part of the song. God is about healing, not wounding, creating, not destroying. Life for the body is its members joined, not severed, not judged bad or good. The healing of the world is the mending of its tissues, the weaving together of its peoples, all of us. The energy of the spirit is harmony, the togethering of different members. The energy of judging and dividing is the energy of evil. The spirit's loving energy is more powerful than fear and separation. All the gifts you've been given are for the sake of healing the world. Even the smallest gift is mighty. Everything belongs, your prayers, your conversations, your riding a bike or the subway, all are part of the symphony. Religions are like that. The observance of Torah, the path to enlightenment, keeping kosher, the hajj, the rosary, the fast, the praise song, the compassion meditation. Each is a different gift, but no less part of the body. So belong and be at peace. One day when I was thinking about my funny life and how my personality seems so wrong for what I've been called to do, and how in the end I always reach out to God and to the people around me to steady myself. And I wrote this poem, I'm going to close with this. <laughs> Try as I might to maintain a steady gait. I walk like a drunk through life, cloudy and crooked on a path laid straight before me. From halls of love and laughter, fear and tears, I emerge alone and quiet, not sad, but wondering how I found myself here. God called me, I say, and I believe that happened as it happens to all of us at times. God called me and I said okay, not knowing what was ahead. Like Peter stepping out of a rocking boat onto the stormy water, I thought I could. I still think if this damp water would hold still for just a moment, I might make it all the way to Jesus. Meanwhile, I reach for the outstretched hand. Amen. We're going to stand as we're able for our final hymn, He Touched Me. 